Welcome, Dr. James Beckett, Sports Card Insights. I want to thank my sponsors, Top Spinini, Upper Deck, Heritage Auctions, Huggins and Scott Auctions, Mike Stadium Sports Cards, Burbank Sports Cards, ComC.com, and Beckett Media, Beckett Grading, Beckett Authentication. So here's uh, an episode for your listening enjoyment. I know there were no credible established racing car prices when you guys began the racing magazine. What kind of process did you guys go through in gathering the pricing and how difficult of a job was that? It was really simple for me because I didn't really participate in it very much. You know, I collected everything and I probably had some, but we wound up hiring some guys and we made extensive use of correspondence and people around it. If you turn the clock back 30 years, it was pretty regional southeast most of the shows were north carolina and below so we were hitting those same shows we had dedicated staff and we had people helping out that were doing other sports but you can't manufacture passion instantly for a sport if you didn't collect it so we had to have people that were knowledgeable about nascar but the When we did it, though, there were a bunch of sets coming out. And so we didn't, like, decide one day to do it and put a magazine out the next day. We really had a fair amount of lead time. And it was a team effort. And I was pretty far removed from the day-to-day pricing. I really had some guys I trusted. The hardest one of a price guy to do is the first one. After the first one, you get feedback. And people say, hey, you really missed on that one. So, well... And when you're missing on a price guide, it's because we're analyzing the data that we have, but we don't have all the data. And so as we got more data and better sources, we were able to be more accurate. So we found out who were the better dealers in the country. It was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it because I wasn't as nose to the grindstone on that particular sport. Going back and looking through other magazines, or a few other price guides that were I started like December of 89 up until that point, but it seemed like when Beckett started to produce a price guide, they just shut down. It wasn't even, did you guys hire them or was there any communication with some of those other price guides? You've got to be careful. not going to plagiarize. They were doing stuff. There were some of them out there. Again, very regional. We were a lot more national and international. And I will say this, thanks to the number of people within NASCAR, we had good entree and access to some of the drivers and teams and some of the leadership. And so that was helpful. But we were using some of the same sources. There were a few key dealers, and we were circulating around to the shows, even the specific NASCAR shows that were pretty much Charlotte area or North Carolina was heavy, Daytona, anything anything in between there. There were some good shows, but it was a challenge. Like I said, we don't want to plagiarize, but if everybody's trying to do a price guide that's accurate, it's going to be having some similarities. But we were really consistent in our approach and in our frequency. And so if we're coming out every month, we're going to get better and better. And we did. I've said, I don't want to have a monopoly. I just want to be in first place. We weren't trying to drive anybody out of business because, again, it's a very relational sport where even the drivers are competitors, but they realize they're all in it together. There's probably a few renegades there, but most of them realize they need each other. Trying to wreck anybody, for the most part, they just want to win. It seemed like they had closed up shop before you guys really even were getting going. And plus, you guys had a bigger distribution channel since... Racing was, what, your fifth price guide? Yeah, it was probably. baseball, football, basketball, hockey, and then racing? We, have I been, mean, we yeah. may have been doing Future Stars by then. I'm not okay. sure about that. But anyway, but that was another positive. We had some sort of distribution muscle by having all these card shops out there. And if we're talking about 96, that's after the baseball strike. And we weren't the only ones looking for other avenues. The card shops were thinking, hey, what else is out there if they're not going to play baseball? But these others, it's hard to publish. It's hard to put something in print and have people criticize. I was glad that they bought the magazine and then criticized constructively because we could work for that. These others, I just think by that time, we had a pretty, pretty sharp staff. The adding one more publication wasn't the same as having 
a business just with one publication. It was on top of the other success we had, and so covered our overhead and the show trips. They'd go to a show, and then they'd also hit the NASCAR show. When you guys started doing the grading, was racing part of the original rollout that you guys did for grading, or did that come later? My sense is that we were doing it. Now, that first year, when we were showing people what we were doing, we weren't showing racing cards. But if you turn the clock back there, it was still heavy on baseball in terms of the grading. Basketball was coming on, football was coming on, but the big cards were mainly baseball. And that's mainly what we were grading in the beginning. But Logan, I don't think we turned away NASCAR. We had a library of NASCAR cards, which I own now because a lot of it was mine. And then it was the companies which became mine. I've maintained that. And I've told them if they ever need to look for any exemplars or samples, I'm at their service. So we had a lot of the sets to check for authenticity. Not everything, but enough samples that people could see, hey, this is real. There were counterfeiting some NASCAR cards, but that was predictably some better cards. Right. Stepping away from the price guide aspect of it a little bit, I wanted to see if you remembered some stuff from those times with the other brands. And we had the Maxes and Upper Deck for a couple of years and then Press Pass, of course. Do you remember any of the other brands, say like a Pacific, for example, that considered racing and that never came to fruition? Pacific? I mean, I knew those guys pretty well, actually. And they were more of like a family run company. And I think they studied a lot of things. But being in, in the Seattle area, Mike Kramer, the owner also did a lot of photos. I bet he went to some races and checked it out, but you know, there's licensing issues. And it, by that time, Definitely. when they were rolling, it was getting to be a pretty crowded field. And he was a sharp business guy. And he had his hands full with going after the major licenses. And th they didn't make it easy for him because he was smaller. But he would have been a good addition. He would have brought some creativity to it. If you look at some mm -hmm. of the thing specific was doing with the die cutting. They were ahead of their time on some things. Yeah, for sure. Because there is still a lot of the inserts and stuff that are very popular and still very rare and command a good deal of money on the major sports. So I think I would agree with you on that. They probably would have done some, some pretty cool stuff that we'd still like to see today. But I think the NASCAR people, they don't want to oversaturate the card landscape. And so to add another licensee, after the right. upper deck was really doing well at that time, I think, and they were producing a lot of cards. Max had been the kind of the incumbent. Press Pass, actually Press Pass did a lot of innovative things too. So to add Pacific on top of that it already was pretty crowded. We were talking about F1 and where we saw a couple of the drivers going in that <laughs> market. What's been your perspective the past two years or so with F1? Because it's something none of us expected, and we hoped it would happen for NASCAR, and then we didn't really get it. Two years ago, everybody woke up and realized, yep. hey, there's this thing called F1. It's the third most popular sport in the world. And hey, they got some cards. And it just drove the price up like crazy. And everything was on Lewis Hamilton as if he were the only guy. And there's other outstanding drivers that were ignored initially, then the hobby does. They swarm, and then they see, oh, that's getting overheated. What's adjacent? What's next? And so they'd go to some other drivers, and then they'd work their way back for other F1 products and other kinds of motorsports. So I'm hoping, Jason, that it, that rising tide raises all boats, because that was a lot of energy coming into yeah, yeah. racing. Because Indy has never made a mark. It really. IndyCar racing is it's really cool, too. They've had cards, but nothing's really been big. I like it that people are looking for other things. But when the prices get way stretched out like that, then uh, to me, that's a turnoff for somebody who's coming in. It's exciting that you could get something like that. But it's a two-year-old card, and it's five figures even. How many NASCAR cards that are not highly produced, that are hard to find, are worth more than a thousand bucks. There's just not many. There's not many. But in the Topps Chrome Formula One, there were instantly a whole bunch. I just want to make the comment that, that was a lot of hype. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. Pipe is spelled M A R K E T I N G. It probably was coming more from the collectors and dealers that had a position in it as much as it was coming from tops. When something starts to go up, the hobby thinks it's like the arrows in the magazine. They think that means it's going up instead of that it went up. If there'd been a magazine for F1, there'd been an arrow up every month for two years. But at yeah. some point you say, wait a minute, it's already up pretty expensive. Are there really people that want to pay these huge prices when for that you could get almost any Dale Earnhardt card or Jeff Gordon or yeah, Jimmy we, Johnson or Richard Petty or any of the yeah, legends. We, we talk about the pricing of NASCAR so much and the affordability and they pick on me because we'll talk about something and then I'll buy it as we're recording. I'll buy it on Calm C because it's so cheap and affordable and it's Hall of Fame rookie cards are less than $10 on a regular basis. And we thought with that pricing, even if it goes from 10 to 20, that's a doubling and it's still affordable. So I think that's where we thought something should happen or could happen. Very what if you guys just, Swarm better cards, the tougher cards of NASCAR. You only have 35 years to work with, mostly. I mean, so the last 34 years, so just quietly buy up all the ones. It could look like an outrageous bargain, and it could create a run. But there's so many different NASCAR cards over those years. And F1 really mainly had all that demand focused on initially one product. And they forget there's going to be another product for the next year. I'm hard-pressed to call that a Lewis Hamilton rookie card. The guy was after his seventh championship. But people love the narrative of this is going to be big. Like NASCAR, it would have exploded if it was going to. I think that's faulty logic. There's already lots of fans for NASCAR. If Fanatics turns more sports fans into card collectors, there's already tons of NASCAR fans out there. Millions that go to races regularly, that follow. Everybody's talking about soccer, but NASCAR is the same thing. There's a lot of cards for NASCAR. And if you had twice as many people chasing them, I don't know, I'm not saying the prices would double, but there'd be more action and price movement up. And you, you would have wished you to pick those up, Jason. So that I would more do that too. Order. If I see that stuff in a dollar box, I'd pick it up. It doesn't mean it's going to sell immediately, but it, it's a good value by everything you're analyzing. You, you're being sensible about it. It's not that you're such a passionate NASCAR fan that you can't see straight. You're heard of these other things. This ought to be a really good deal eventually. Yeah. And would you think that like with Press Pass and the other ones that the print runs would be a lot lower than the other sports? I would say it depends on what sport, but no, probably of the major sports, yeah, probably in every case. But what you have is you had geographic concentration in the distribution. It might be that in Charlotte, there's just as many of those NASCAR cards as there are baseball or football or basketball, and probably more than hockey. So if people are into NASCAR and they're in those race cities, then maybe they don't think, hey, these are easy to find. It seems like trying to find singles is becoming tough. Com C and Spore Lots and some of the rest of them are starting to get, well, more Com C has availability, but Spore Lots scene has been dwindling down. Like you said, 35 years of cards, but it's hard to find uh, singles and stuff. I'm gonna, I'm, eventually, I'm going to put more stuff on Com C. I've got a decent account on Com C, and I've sold some racing there, but I haven't been through it. I'm systematic when I'll go through my stuff and figure out well, I don't want this anymore. And I'll bust a parallel set or something and put it up there. But I haven't done that yet. But you guys are encouraging me that there probably would be demand. 